In this episode of the Transib Challenge, we arrive in Vladivostok, our last destination, to receive a welcome to remember and explore the Morsky Cry. How's it going? We're about 55-0 hours into an 80-hour train ride. This is where I've been holed up for the past, most of that time actually. I'm not sleeping or eating. I've built this little nest. We have some tea, we have some edits happening, some water, some food, a phone, a Kindle. And I thought, now that we have a little break, I'd show you a little bit what's in the train. Let's go, let's do a little cribs tour of third class on the Trans-Siberian Railway. Okay, so we're in the third class cabin. And to go anywhere, you have to go through no man's land. These series of doors, you have to press buttons, they're like airlocks. Instead of airlocks in space, it's airlocks too. Between trains, woo! You press the buttons, and the doors open, just watch your step. We have another third class cabin. So if you look, you kind of have to dodge some feet as you come through. There's beds, four on the right, two on the left. And there's lots of people, as you can tell right now. Next, we have a second class train, which means each bunk has four beds and they're all completely blocked off by doors. And here, we have the dining car, the oasis from the storm. All right, a journey of 80 hours. It ends in Zadiostok. And we hear music. <laughs> Right. All right. It's really early. We're dressed. We're dressed for the party. I'm not finished yet. Oh, okay. Water of Vladivostok. It's done. It's the final leg. We're in Vladivostok. And it's the party. St. Petersburg all the way to Vladivostok. <laughs> 9,000, woo! 500 whatever, something like that, kilometers later. We are at the Pacific Ocean. And it's a beautiful thing to see. I lost my microphone along the way. That's why you're enjoying these wave noises a bit louder than usual. I can't believe it's over. That 80 hour train journey was our last leg on the train. Now all that's left is to soak it all in, relax on the beach for a few days, and then we're all heading home. I remember on the first day thinking the journey that lied ahead was a long one. But it's funny how time works when you travel. Things go by very, very fast, but very, very slow. Things feel like yesterday, but also like last year at the same time. On one of those lonely hours on the train, one of the guys asked where you're most happy. 
in the mountains, in the forest, at the ocean. I said the jungle, but I've spent a lot of my life next to the ocean. And coming here and seeing this, feeling the cold water on my feet, sitting on these rocks, realizing these rocks have been around much longer than I have and will continue to be here much longer after I leave continually pounded by the waves second after second minute after minute millennia after millennia there is something magical about the ocean we put the cameras down last night when we arrived took tonight just to relax I think we deserved it and today also some relaxing and some hiking so I'm gonna put the camera down again right now get some hiking boots on and show you part of this beautiful slice of Russia you've probably never seen before. Let's go. Always barefoot. Well, not always. I just like the squish between my toes, you know? Look, this feeling right here, this feeling. Oh, yes, oh, yeah. The hard thing about being the drone guy of the group is sometimes you get left behind, <laughs> which is 100% my fault. And actually, I don't mind it at all because being alone in the far east of Russia, about 20 kilometers from North Korea, with the ocean on my left and lakes on my right, giant stone pillars, crickets, frogs. It's not a bad spot to be alone. Look at this beautiful thing, not Yarrow. Well, actually Yarrow too, but behind Yarrow. That is an abandoned Soviet military barracks. And that might have our name on it. For traveler like us, this is the most epic way to die. <laughs> By a snake in a border with China, Russia, and North Korea. Epic. What, what do you think, Gareth? Uh, disagree. <laughs> he disagrees. <laughs> All right. The crew is kitted up. We've got our pants on, we've got our socks on, we've got flashlights, water bottles, and our cameras because this adventure was not on the itinerary. We saw it. We saw it flirting with us in the horizon and we've changed the plan and decided to go explore these abandoned Soviet barracks. The crew continued the hike. For us, a hike's not particularly interesting for content. Uh, these days, a drone can pretty much get better shots than I can handheld with a camera from a viewpoint, so we've decided to do this while they complete the hike. If the day goes perfectly, though, we'll meet them later and go fishing for our supper. As we were saying goodbye, Alexi, me, Alexi handed me these vials saying, watch out, it's for snakes. And we did a bit of research about the poisonous snakes in the area. And it's the common viper, the common northern viper, that should be fine. It says adults weighing over 60 kilograms don't generally die, as well as the fangs are just about four millimeters long, which don't pierce much clothing. Also, the viper emits a loud hiss within three or four meters, and it says it's almost impossible not to hear it when you're approaching them. So we feel pretty good, but we're gonna be careful. And we also have the very strong antihistamines that Alexi gave us. It's not anti-venom, it won't cure the bite, but it'll definitely, definitely help a lot in this case. But hey, when you're exploring new frontiers, you gotta do it safely. There's always a little bit of a risk. Are you over 135 pounds? Man, 210 pounds of anti-venom. His speaking. I'll turn you into a pair of boots. Come at me, boy. <laughs> Snake fighting, fang breaking. On, pure man. steel sex appeal. Come on. <laughs> okay. oh, let's drive up there. Oh, 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 oh. oh We found a... <laughs> 
Oh, all right. So. <laughs> I think that's dry right there. Is it dry? Is it dry? dry? Good. They found out it's dry over there. It's dry. It's dry over there. Great. What's up, guys? When I fell back in the grass, the uh, antihistamine fell out of my pocket, and we went back to look for it, and all we found was the syringes, which is not the important part, unfortunately. So we're going to give a veto on the building here and go to the far building, but... It, uh, it sucks to let down the group a little bit and sucks to make it a bit more dangerous than it has to be. I'm hoping it's not a bigger problem. We made it, boys. Yeah. So the Soviet Union fell in 1991, and the rumors are this building's been abandoned for longer than that, or at least it looks that way. It is falling to pieces. One of my favorite things, though, about first encountering abandoned buildings is seeing them with no graffiti. And there's no graffiti on this one. Oh wow. This is crazy. Right when you walk in, there is some graffiti. 1985, 1985. That's the year I was born. This place is completely overgrown. There's really not much left of it. It's a busted out old concrete skeleton of a old Soviet building. You can tell between the floors they use some kind of granite or different kind of stone. Also some bricks. Nature's completely filled these old rooms with vines and different plants. Places like this have a special kind of beauty to me. Being reclaimed by nature, I think is something that fascinates me. Because we all get reclaimed by nature at some point. <laughs> and I think it's a symbol of that. No matter what happens, everything on this planet eventually turns back into earth. Back to dust. Ah, uh, here you can see where they used to ran, run the old wooden rafters between floors. That's why there's no floors left. Because the floors are made out of wood. What are your thoughts and impressions? No wonder reason why the, the Soviets fell. They all had a wooden floors. <laughs> For me, the most interesting thing is the idea that here uh, was an SP area in North Korea, in China, during the Soviet Union. I imagine the historical things, what happened here. But for the rest, yes, an abandoned building. Ruben is right. We're next to Korea. We're, we're next to North Korea. We're next to China. This must have been a pretty important place at one point. Futures. Our futures are safe. We are safe. We are safe. Boys, back in action. Back we in action. Back. Don't tell Alexi. All right. After a wild afternoon, wild and wet afternoon, we are thrashed by this mud and water. We found our antihistamines, which means we are now snake proof again, and we're headed back to camp where the boys should be returning back home with their catch of raw seafood from the ocean. Alexi's an expert, and uh, that's what's on the menu tonight. We're back at camp. We see one man there crouched next to the ocean and another small dot with a mask and a snorkel catching our dinner. All right, we got to go pro. We got some swimming shorts. We got maybe half an hour before sunset. Let's go join Alexi and see what we can find. 
in this giant, beautiful, whoo, cold swimming pool. Let's go. Alexis gifted me his mass snorkeling fins. I'm gonna give it a shot. So what am I looking for underwater? You look uh, for some two small eyes in, under the sand, like, just like, like this. <laughs> this, from this part, they're breathing uh -huh. and trying to filter and catch food okay. from the water. All right, cool. Clam hunting time. Treasures. Let's get dinner started. All right, guys, a couple more for the pot. Yeah, thanks. We've got to clean this one off with a knife yep. first, right? Yep. So mussels attach themselves to the substrate, the ocean floor, with these little tiny small fibers. And when you buy them in a store, they've shaved all of that off. Because you can't really eat it. This here, this pink, see that? It's actually a coral, a coralline algae. It's like a hard, crusty pink. And it's not your typical coral you'd see in a coral reef, but it is still very much a coral. All right. So if you arrow here, cracking them open sideways. There is a stone yep. there. And just try to find orange carrier. The orange caviar is what yeah. we eat, the uni, and you can eat it raw, correct? Yeah, then we will clean it. So half of this we will use in seafood pasta and half we will eat it just raw. We're having seafood pasta tonight? Yep. Oh, we're eating too well out here in the wilderness. Guys, we got wine, we got fresh seafood. This is not camping, this is luxury. Alex, my man, explain to me what you've created. Yeah, just pasta. It's pasta and uh, so mussels. Yeah. Plus um, this stuff, I don't know how it's called in English. Clams, yeah. Yeah, clams, special clams who live under the sand. But a small one inside the, the big one, uh -huh. like this. Wow. In a perfect condition, it will be plus Austin plus scallop. And now we, we have only this. Well, we don't have oysters, we don't have scalpels, we have an amazing chef. Yeah, but it's created. not me, it's not me. <laughs> it's definitely, you look at this. This is like a gourmet meal, man. Yeah, like fresh seafood pasta caught from the ocean. Socks and shoes roasting by the open fire. We got friends, we got some brandy, we got some vodka. We got a great cap on an amazing day. Cheers our to, to our chef. Uh, to the chef. Our hunter and chef. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Cheers, man. To y'all for setting this whole thing up. Woo! In the next and final episode of the Transab Challenge, we explore an abandoned gun battery on the coast of Primorsky Krai. And we finally say goodbye. Anyone looking for employment, this is the, we're the only ones. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>